I want the main antagonist, and that's John Hoops from the University of Kansas. All right, everybody, welcome back to Archaeology with Flint Dibble. And I am joined today with a special guest of the channel, Dr. John Hoops of the University of Kansas, and he is perfect for what we're about to embark on. Clint, yeah. I'm going to interrupt you for one thing. My oh. name is pr actually pronounced Hoops. All right, so here we go. We are here with Professor John Hoops, not Hoops, as he points out. So let's not jump through any hoops today. And the reason we're here is uh, Graham Hancock announced recently that the second season of Ancient Apocalypse is coming out soon on Netflix. And so I wanted to do something in advance of that. And the topic of this season is the Americas. So there's really nobody better to talk to than Professor Hoops, because not only is he someone who studies and researches and writes on pseudo-archaeology and on Graham Hancock's ideas, but he's also one of the world experts in the archaeology of the Americas with a focus on South American archaeology. So thank you for joining us, uh, John. And uh, yeah, do you want to give a little introduction spiel to yourself or anything like that for people to know? Well, I want to make a little bit of a confession, Flint, especially given the themes of what you're interested in and what Graham Hancock is interested in. But I thought that everybody would find it worthwhile to understand that I actually got my start in archaeology uh, by reading a lot of science fiction, a lot of fantasy when I was a kid. And the very first research paper that I ever wrote in my life was for a 10th grade English class. It was about Atlantis. I, I put this paper online, so if, if people want to read it, they can, but I really want them to you know, be charitable. Remember that I wrote this when I was only 15 years old, and I actually started the paper as an Atlantis believer. But by the time I'd completed the research for the paper, um, I was really tipping over into archaeology. You could have taken a very different path in life, John. I mean, this is like, you know, what's hilarious is when I prepared for my conversation with Graham Hancock on Joe Rogan, we enlisted Professor Hoops here to play the part of Graham Hancock. Wait a second, we're going to have a clip from uh, the practice debate so we can see just how well John predicted Graham Hancock. Roll that now. John Hoops, uh, who has been attacking me online uh, relentlessly for years, uh, and he won't put his money where his mouth is. He's refused to come and speak to me, and I just think that that's terrible. We all know that archaeology represents the establishment point of view. And the reason why is because, well, he used to have many of the same ideas. And I, for one, I want to make this clear to everybody. Look, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you're not a bad person if you believe in Atlantis um, or things like that. That's, that's not the issue here. But at the same time, as archaeologists who are familiar with archaeology, the public is interested in, in the real picture, the real evidence. And so that's what we're here to present, right? We want to try to share, all right, what is the picture of archaeology in the Americas? Is some of the stuff we cover might get talked about in the show. Some of it might not, but what we're trying to do is give a nice fill in the picture so that people understand what, what scholars actually say. And that's our goal with this conversation here. So it's really meant to inoculate and pre-bunk, not meant to be a debunk of this show that's coming out. It's meant to say, hey, this is actually the picture of what archaeologists are saying. So uh, do you have anything you want to say before we get started, John? The main point I wanted to make with that little bit about the paper on Atlantis that I wrote 50 years ago um, is that archaeology is a journey of discovery. We're constantly learning new things, but it's one in which we also gain an appreciation for what archaeologists do and what the data tells us and what the evidence tells us, which is constantly being expanded upon. This is what archaeological research is all about. Mm -hmm. um, and the amount of information that's available now compared to 50 years ago is, is mind-blowing. The information that's available now compared to 20 or even 10 years ago uh, is also something that... Um, as all of us who are professional archaeologists know, um, we spend you know a huge amount of time just keeping on top of what appears in the journals. Yeah. Um, so so there's there's new information all the time. So the idea that archaeologists don't change our minds, that we're somehow impervious to new information, is is total bullshit. We're constantly considering new information. Yeah, I mean, like, look, every single article we publish in a peer-reviewed journal is meant to update our picture on the past and say something new or different based on new evidence, new methods, or something along those lines, a new a new question or idea. I mean, my the phrase I always use is we're always rewriting history. That is what we are in the job of doing. And so, yeah, the idea that that, that we don't want to overturn past paradigms 
is ludicrous. I myself have tried to overturn various past paradigms of the, of the past, and other, so have my colleagues. And consensus is not something that is decided from top down. It's something that's decided over time based on what gets mentioned and cited and published and taught in classrooms, uh, rather than there's some sort of archaeology mafia out there that tells us what to all believe. You know, when you were a PhD student, you must have all sort of learned the same kind of stuff because there's so much, there's so little uh, new information coming out compared to today where PhD students in every single university are just learning a very idiosyncratic course of readings and, and information because there's just so much there can be filtered into so many different methods and questions. So on that note, let's think about uh, America and the Ice Age. I just had a great conversation with your colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Jennifer Raff about sort of the very earliest evidence of people with genetics and archaeology and what it shows. And this is something that Graham likes to talk about a lot, is this overturning of the paradigm of Clovis first. Part of the issue we, we have with that is not so much that like, we, we, we agree this paradigm is overturned. And in some cases, the argument over it was very uh, aggressive in a way that, that was not great. There were not always great actors involved. But the problem is, is that there's this uh, focus on the earliest people in America when what's ignored is the Clovis culture itself that's sort of all over the Americas at the end of the Ice Age, which is exactly the same period that Hancock believes that his civilization existed. I think I showed this map in my conversation with uh, Graham on Joe Rogan. This is every single area where polluted points have been found in North America. It's all over. It's near the coasts on the Pacific. It's really all over with a lot of density in, uh, from the eastern half of North America. And so to ignore this kind of evidence is, is a problem. So I wanted to ask you, what can we say about uh, Clovis culture and this period right at the end of the Ice Age? What can you tell me? I'm not an Americanist after all. Well, Clovis, unfortunately, is something that uh, uh, we haven't been talking about nearly as much in discussions of pre-Clovis. And, and there's no question that pre-Clovis is a really exciting story. Um, I just wanted to, to, to mention that I saw a lot of the story unfold. I was an archaeology major uh, in college when the information about Monteverdi and Tom Dillete's research at this incredible site in Chile uh, first was coming out. Mm -hmm. um, and we discussed it. And this was in the 1970s. And then I got to see the entire process unfold, including uh, Tom Dillahay inviting a number of other archaeologists to come down to Monteverdi. Uh, ultimately, they put the, the, the idea that pre-Clovis didn't exist to rest um, in the early 1990s. Uh, mm -hmm. when there was a, a big consensus uh, on the basis of the evidence and actual visits to the site, um, that ultimately, yes, um, there was a pre-Clovis occupation of the Americas. There's no question about that. But pre-Clovis sites are relatively rare, few and far between, especially compared to Clovis. Clovis sites are all over the place. And if we expand that to sites with what are called fluted points, mm -hmm. uh, the points that are characteristic of the late Pleistocene, we have those from Alaska all the way down to Terra del Fuego. And not yeah, only let me we have get sites... up one of those maps of South America, because this is important for people to see. And thank you a ton for these great images. But yeah, you can see here, these are Pleistocene archaeological sites in South America. So Pleistocene meaning end of the Ice Age, right? The density of them and notice that they're near coastlines, which is exactly where an idea of a lost civilization that would be near the coasts. But we have hunter-gatherer sites near the coasts in North America, in South America, um, particularly along the Pacific, right? Yes. Well, and it shouldn't be that surprising that we, we where you see a gap on that map, mm -hmm. uh, the area where you don't see a whole lot of dots, uh, is an area that looks a lot like this, my backdrop. It's the <laughs> rainforest. It's the Amazon basin. And there's some good reasons why we don't have more information about the place to see in the Amazon basin. Uh, it's hard to find, and there's been a lot of remodeling of that landscape. <laughs> Um, but there are sites there. And in fact, uh, Anna Roosevelt, uh, my, my colleague at the University of Illinois, Chicago, has uh, been able to find Pleistocene Age sites in the Amazon basin. Um, yeah. And she published these 20 years ago. Um, so we're filling in those blanks. We have been filling in those blanks. And we actually know a lot more about the Pleistocene occupation of all of South America and also Central America and all the way up. But Clovis, which, which existed between about 11,500 and about 10,800 BP, was an amazing phenomenon. It was people across the entire hemisphere 
who were hunting mammoths and mastodons and ground sloth and all of these amazing creatures and battling saber-toothed tigers and and, and dealing with a, a really challenging landscape. Um, but the story of Clovis' persistence and survival is 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 an amazing story. And it's one that merits a lot more attention. It used to get all of the attention, but you know, with pre-Clovis, um, it's it's gotten much less attention. But the the invention of the of the atlatl, this this amazing throwing device, uh, which is great in terms of both accuracy and and velocity, and it was so effective that it was still being used when the Spanish encountered the Aztecs. The Aztecs were using atlatl. So this is a piece of technology that lasted for. 12,000 years or more. I mean, one of the issues with pre-Clovis is that we only have a few sites that have projectile points. Uh, and so we really don't as n understand as much about uh, uh, projectile point technology during pre-Clovis as we would like. There's some really fascinating uh, points, including what are called El Hobo points that are known from Venezuela and also from Monteverde, Chile. Mm -hmm. um, but the whole issue of what the artifact complex looked like for pre-Clovis is still quite challenging. But we do understand Clovis technology. We do understand fluted point technology. We do, do understand also a, a whole different type of technology called Magellan point technology or fishtail points, uh, which are much more characteristic of Central and South America. And one of the amazing things about Costa Rica, which is where I work, that's where my career has been, is that we get both kinds. We get, we get Clovis style points and we get fishtail style points. Mm -hmm. So right there in the middle of the Western hemisphere uh, in Costa Rica and in Panama, uh, we get this convergence of of different uh, technologies. Um, and the area around the Caribbean basin and the Gulf of Mexico from, from, from Florida all the way down to Colombia has the biggest variation in projectile point styles uh, from the late Pleistocene of anywhere in the Americas, which suggests that this is where they emerge. This is where they develop. This is where, huh. we, where we have that diversity because they've been there the longest. So there's an enormous amount to study still uh, with respect to um, with the, the late Pleistocene. Uh, one of the wonderful things about Google Earth is it not only shows you the land, but it also shows you submarine features. Mm -hmm. And what I want everyone to notice in this particular image is that Florida at the end of the Pleistocene was about four times as wide as it is now. Okay, mm -hmm. look at that under the, that underwater landscape. The Yucatan Peninsula was about three times the size it is now. And off of uh, Honduras and Nicaragua, you could probably actually have walked to Jamaica from Honduras uh, because <laughs> of those underwater landscapes. And so when we're talking about the world of Clovis people, the world of the, the late Pleistocene, you know, before the end of the Ice Age, look at all of that light blue area. That was inhabited landscape. Um, and sort of the next phase of archaeology in this area is going to be using submersibles, using scuba diving and other types of things to explore what are undoubtedly underwater sites, which will help us to understand this variation and this emergence of all of these amazing technologies towards the end, end of the Pleistocene. It's a quick plug. I have an interview on this channel with uh, Dr. Jessica Cookale about underwater archaeology right here off the coast of Florida, finding flint napping locations where they're making similar stone tools to these right at the end of the Pleistocene, early Holocene. So right at this time period, archaeologists are finding these kind of sites underwater, that more will emerge. And it all matches similarly. It adds to our information, but it matches what not that necessarily what we'd expect, but it matches to the larger picture that archaeologists have put together from what we found above water, right? Well, and, and, so. and there are some people who will claim that archaeologists are not paying attention uh, to the continental shelves and not paying attention to, the, to these submerged landscapes. And that's bullshit. We are paying attention. We are looking. We've known about them. We think about them. And we know that there are going to be archaeological sites that are there. It's just very expensive to explore them. Underwater archaeology is, 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 is something that requires funding. So yeah. I'm, this is going to be the first time I'm going to make this plug, and I know that Clint Dibble will make this plug as well. Archaeology needs more funding. Archaeologists <laughs> need more grants. Archaeologists have these ideas and things that we want to research, but we need we need the funding to do it, whether it's coming from public or private sources. So if you're interested in these problems, support the funding of real archaeological research. Yeah. And I mean, I just want to emphasize, since you brought up Anna Roosevelt really quickly, you know, underwater archaeology is important, but uh, people have been exploring, for example, the Amazon at the end of the Ice Age, you know, for 13,000 years, 
Um, this is fairly well published. You can see this article is from 2014. So it's not something that we are ignoring. We are devoting our effort to really exploring everywhere around the world in harsh areas from deserts to underwater to jungles. That is what we do. We try to find the evidence for our ancestors everywhere in the world that we can search. Yeah. Yeah. And we will do more of it if we're funded. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about uh, in at the, in this Pleistocene period? Or... And I just want to emphasize that one of the reasons why there had been so much an emphasis on on Clovis is that the artifacts are absolutely spectacular. <laughs> um, you, you, you get these amazing uh, projectile points that are made out of clear rock crystal. You get them made out of obsidian glass. You get them made out of high quality uh, chert uh, with these what are called ultra passe flakes that, that they're intentionally made. See all those diagonal thinning flakes across that point? People had mastered the art of flint napping. Uh, and they were making some of the most beautiful uh, chipstone artifacts that, that anyone's ever made. So Clovis culture is is an, is amazing, and and it really is something that the more people look into it, the more they will see exactly why archaeologists were so excited about it. Yes, we were excited about pre-Clovis, but Clovis is exciting too. Yeah, and it's, it's and it shows this kind of connections in a sense, uh, and I suppose diffusion even uh, of this kind of technology across the Americas, which is something we'll get into in more depth uh, in later periods, but we can already start to see this relationship in lithics, right, and stone tools at this time at the end of the Ice Age, right? And so there, there's something there that shows how connected, in a sense, uh, people are across the Americas. There's this kind of connections there. Um, yeah, absolutely. People were moving around and moving around relatively quickly. I mean, this is something else about about Clovis culture, what sometimes referred to as, as fluted point culture or this cult, yeah. these cultures, many, many different cultures of the Pleistocene. Uh, this is showing, uh, based on genetic evidence, uh, the, the different migrations that occur from the northwest all the way down into North America and South America is that we know that there were multiple populations that were moving. It wasn't just one people. It was several different groups at different times. Um, but that little uh, inset image on the right is one that emphasizes the area that I specialize in, which is which is Southern Central America and Northern South America. And one of the reasons I think it's so cool is that that is exactly where these different populations made decisions about how they were going to uh, occupy the landscape. And some went east and some went west down through the Andes and some went up the mountains and rivers into the interior. Um, but it was actually in eastern Panama and Colombia that, that this split took place. And these are the ancestors of all South Americans, but they were different sets of ancestors. Uh, and we know from, from genetics and, and Jenny Raff, whose office is right next door to mine, by the way, <laughs> um, Jenny Raff probably explained uh, how genetics is, is showing the complexity of how these populations moved across the landscape. And it really is a pretty fantastic story. Because yeah. there's because there's so many different landscapes, so many different ways to adapt, whether whether it's to dry deserts or whether it's wet rainforests or whether it's coastal regions or interior mountains. Uh, humans are incredibly versatile. Uh, and the story of the Americas is how people adapted to a huge range of different uh, different uh, uh, landscapes and, and did it extraordinarily well. Yeah, I think that's really important in the way that we put together multiple lines of evidence to demonstrate that from these stone tools to the human remains and genomics and then the food that they're eating. All of this, it's multiple lines of evidence to tie together to make this picture that uh, is being built and still being built with all the evidence and methods that we use today. And, yeah. and the diversity is really important because there are some people who will harp on what ultimately is kind of a unitary origin. Everything came from one place. Everything has the same ancestry. That's not true. <laughs> There's a lot of diversity early on. You know, 20,000, 13,000 years ago, there was a lot of diversity. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing this article with Jose Irarte. Uh, yes, Serrani. that's a really cool thing. That's, that, that's this, some new yeah. stuff. So here he is. And then this is the article that we're talking about, colonization and early peopling of the Colombian Amazon. Yeah, well, this is this is uh, one of the one of the coolest areas of, uh, of of South America. There are a number of sites that that are found in in sort of central Colombia and and, and southern Colombia, um, uh, just kind of on the edge of the uh, Amazon rainforest, all, all the way up what 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 is the Orinoco? That big river that you see running uh, across the the top of that map is the Orinoco, which which ultimately 
uh, empties out in, into the Atlantic. But way, way up in the tributaries to the Orinoco uh, are some amazing discoveries of rock art uh, in the Serranía La Lindosa of southern Colombia, um, where the researchers have been identifying um, about an eight kilometer uh, uh, stretch of rock walls that are covered with these fantastic uh, paintings, uh, which include handprints. I mean, this is something very familiar to, to people who look at, at, at cave art from France and Spain, uh, but people in the Americas were also leaving their handprints and, and creating these, these huge murals that show all different kinds of animals, geographic uh, or, or uh, geometric designs. It, it, it's really kind of interesting to figure out how we're going to decode what's being represented here, but you just see the richness of what's there. There are pictures of, of people. Uh, there are also animals. This has been interpreted um, as evidence of, you can see a human figure on the left and then a big looming thing right there. It's kind of hard to tell what that is. But these have been interpreted as visual representations of human encounters with Pleistocene megafauna, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is an interesting hypothesis in that that is one interpretation, but there are also other interpretations. And in fact, my colleague Anna Roosevelt is skeptical that these are representations of Pleistocene megafauna. She points out that, yes, it looks like an encounter between a number of people and a great big uh, creature here but those may not have been painted at the same time. This, this whole mural is a bit of a palimpsest. Uh, there are also claims that they're representations of mammoths or mastodons, uh, but Anna points out that in fact, the taper has a long flexible snout and the image on the left could be the representation of a taper is not necessarily a representation of a mammoth or a mastodon. Mm -hmm. um, so the claims that this, this rock art goes all the way back to the late Pleistocene are a little bit problematic, but really intriguing and, and, and things that archaeologists are researching. And we're not ignoring it. We're not, you know, looking at this evidence and saying, no, that couldn't possibly be. It's, it's just the opposite. People are saying, well, yeah, that could be. Let's, let's look at it more closely. Let's, let's see if we can find other evidence to indicate when this rock art was, was painted and what it represents. Uh, unfortunately, rock art is notoriously difficult to date. Yeah, it's one of the issues. There's some uh, rock art on Crete that uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Tom Strasser, has published, and he tried to get me involved to, to as a zooarchaeologist to look at those animals and speciate them as this extinct species of deer. But I, I was very skeptical. It's, it's like these. It's very uh, stylized. And it's rough, so there's no clear markers of species. And it could have easily been these feral goats that we see in later periods, uh, like Minoan and, and Bronze Age iconography. And, and many of them look just similarly stylized and rough. And so it's notoriously difficult to not only date rock art with something uh, scientific, absolute dating, but it's also notoriously difficult to sometimes do the same kind of precise identification of species that we'd like to do scientifically on animal bones and teeth on stylized art. It's and that's tough. how we test these things. As yeah. you look at the rock art, you say, well, could this have been this? And then you do excavations at sites associated with the rock art to see whether the faunal remains are there. Exactly. Yeah, um, and yeah. one of the things in this Serra Nila Lindosa is that there are images, there are images that people identify as horses, um, and, you know, horses uh, became extinct at the end of the Pleistocene. They were reintroduced by Spanish in the 16th century. Um, but there are people who say that they're horses that are depicted in the Colombian rock art. Um, but as you know, Flint, there are a lot of things that could look like horses in art. Uh, yeah. You know, they, 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 they could be deer. Uh, they, they could be other animals. It, it's not 100% clear that they're horses. The way that we figure out whether there were horses that are being depicted is to find archaeological sites associated with the rock art and then see whether there are faunal remains that are there that, that help us to understand this. That's a good point, because just because it could be this or could be that, it doesn't mean it is this or that. It means we need to keep testing to see if there's one way to exclude uh, or, or, or make one of those hypotheses more or less likely. Um, so, yeah, that's actually how we go about it. We, we're willing to entertain a wide range of possibilities, but we want evidence to confirm one or the other before we actually say it is one or the other. And ideally, um, multiple lines of evidence. It's it's yeah. the faunal evidence that supports the iconographic interpretations. And the more lines of evidence you have from the more specialists, the better, which is why archaeology is also multidisciplinary. Oh, yeah. We're, every project I've been on has, I don't know, at least seven or eight specialists <laughs> and oftentimes many more, especially for post-excavation. 
Okay, uh, shall we move on to the history of lost and found in the Americas and start thinking about how these sites were originally found and how we find them today and what that says about our understanding of the past in the Americas. So I guess we could start off with some of these early images of explorers in the Americas. Uh, what, what, what's your point with highlighting these, these ones? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the the trope of exploration is 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 long and deep, uh, and actually, I've been using these images uh, lately to sort of poke fun at the idea that there were giants in the Americas. Because if you look at the guy on the left, his his name is Desire Charnay, he's an early explorer, uh, and then you look at the slide or the or the image on the right, you'll you'll see that the his porter. Uh, must be about nine or ten feet tall. So there we have evidence for giants. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what's what's being represented here is this this trope of exploration. You know, yeah. that the, the white guy from Europe is able to find things that the local people didn't know about, uh, which is really not exactly the case. Most of the big discoveries that have been made have been made actually by 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 kids who were, who were leading visiting archaeologists to go visit places like Machu Picchu. People who live there know know that it's there. Uh, but Charnay was uh, was an early explorer who actually believed that the Toltecs had come from the Himalayas um, in in the in the late 19th century, um, and emphasized uh, ultimately the the idea of these kind of white white culture bearers. But anyway, I, I put that in just as a as a trope of this early exploration. Uh, other early explorers included um, uh, John Lloyd Stevens, Frederick Catherwood, who who made this beautiful engraving on the left of a of a pyramid in. Uh, in Veracruz, Mexico. And then on the right, you see uh, uh, Alfred Maudsley, who was one of the first people to take cameras uh, to the Maya ruins oh. and, and photograph, had a, had a, this is a selfie, uh, actually, not technically a selfie, but that's that's Maudsley standing up in the tower at Palenque, uh, having a photograph of himself um, and his indigenous assistants, who you can see down below, um, during the clearing and excavations of, of Palenque and Chiapas. Among the things that I uh, have noticed is that the promotion materials for this new series on Netflix are claiming that the Americas were underexplored. You know, it's this idea that um, that new information is being presented uh, that people hadn't known about, which which I have a negative reaction to because I also teach about the history of archaeology, uh, and I teach about these early explorers, and 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 the reality is we've known about these many of these places for over a hundred years. Um, we, we may not know them perfectly. We're constantly adding new information to it. The first maps that we have of Palenque are from the 18th century. Hmm. Um, so it's not something that's a new discovery. This is something we've kind of been adding to our information about over the years, but but we actually know quite well. So I got a question for you. You've been working down in Costa Rica in that area for a long time, several decades, right? Uh, I first went down there in 1978 when I was 19 there you years go. old. So we're talking a long time. You have been hiking around there for a very long time. Have you ever found an undiscovered, untouched, beautiful ruin? Uh, I don't want to say all the time, but the answer to that is yes, that's what we do. We do archaeological survey. Um, the, 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 the issue of discover is not one that archaeologists use that often. I have recorded them. I've given numbers to the sites that I found during a survey. Do I know whether I discovered it or not? No, because people live there. People mm -hmm. people have hunt there. People fish there. People see these things. I have been the first to record dozens and dozens, maybe even hundreds of, of archaeological sites from survey because I write down that it's there. I make notations of what we found there. It, it gets recorded. But is recording discovery? Well, not not exactly. Um, it, it, it's, it's making that information available to other researchers so they can go back and, and visit the site again and, and, and put together maps of settlement patterns and a whole host of other things. Uh, but that's what archaeologists do. We, we record the evidence of the past in a way that we are creating data that other people can use. Mm -hmm. So, so d this discovery trope, well, discovering is not the greatest term, it's creating data and documentation that can be used by us and our colleagues to better understand the past. Yeah, it's a lot, unfortunately, a lot more boring than it shows in the movies, but it is really important. And once you put it all together, you have something interesting to say um, about the past, right? And that's, that's what then generates news stories and other kinds of media, this conversation, even right here. Um, do you want to talk about some of these other early examples of discovery that's not discovery? Let's talk about those mound builder sites, because yeah, that's something sure. that becomes a, I suspect that there's going to be more of that um, in, in the upcoming series. 
again, I'd like to emphasize that some of the first archaeological research that was done in the Americas was undertaken in the early 19th century. It was actually commissioned by the Smithsonian Institution. And um, Ephraim Squire and Edwin Davis uh, visited, mapped, and recorded hundreds of archaeological sites in the eastern United States, which they published in 1848. That's where these illustrations are coming from. Mm -hmm. Many of these sites have been compromised and wiped out. Unfortunately, there's been settlement on top of them. And we'll come back to these later when we talk about these, uh, quote unquote, geoglyph sites in the Amazon. It's really intriguing that these ditch and embankment structures, which actually look a lot like Neolithic Europe, uh, have actually been found in the eastern United States. Now, I don't think that's because of a connection between Neolithic Europe and the U.S., but people came up with similar solutions to problems, uh, and that included enclosing dance grounds or enclosing portions of their settlement uh, with palisades, with walls that were made of a combination of, of mounded earth and vegetation. And that's what we're seeing here. One of the most important of these places is the Newark Works, which are currently in Newark, Ohio. And actually, if you go to the next slide, uh, there's a dramatic contrast. What you see on the left and the right is exactly the same place. These fantastic earthworks that were mapped by Squire and Davis in the early 19th century are now the location of Newark, Ohio. And if you look closely, you can see how the ruins have been, in some cases, preserved. Um, you can actually see the, the polygons over on the right-hand side, uh, right there. And then there's a large earth circle down at the bottom. But the rest of it is being covered by urban, urban expansion. Yeah. Um, and this particular archaeological site uh, has just recently, this past year, uh, as a result of work by Brad Lepper and a number of other wonderful archaeologists, has now been designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, even though it is underneath all of this you know, urban expansion. Archaeologists are meticulously documenting what remains. Um, and one of the problems with archaeological sites today is that they're being destroyed. They're still being built on top of. They're still being developed. But we can see them using our tools, using the way that archaeologists look at things. We can piece together what's there underneath the, the, the track developments and underneath the roads. And, and that's probably the biggest part of archaeology that's done today is uh, cultural resource management. The vast majority of professional archaeologists work in the documentation and the protection of cultural heritage. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's obviously because it's it, that requires nonstop maintenance and uh, re-updating and protection. So it's going to be the kind of thing that, yeah, employs most people. Um, yeah, fantastic. I think that's important. Whether or not it shows up in this season two, it's important to get a sense of those mounds and what they what they mean. You know, people say, well, there aren't conspiracies, but there actually has been a conspiracy to hide the truth of American history. Uh, and part of that truth is that one of the reasons why Squire and Davis went and explored all of these abandoned sites is that they had been intentionally evacuated during the forced migrations of the Trail of Tears, forced relocation of the five tribes of the American Southeast as a result of Jacksonian policies in the 1830s. Mm -hmm. uh, what you see here on this map is, is how it was that tens of thousands of Native people were displaced from their traditional lands to uh, territories in the West, like Oklahoma, removing them from this sacred landscape, taking them away from these sacred sites so that they could be developed, so that they could turn into farms, so that they could be turned into cities. And that's you know, that's a really important part of American history is that archaeologists have not been hiding this from anybody. If anything, it's being hidden by people who don't want to confront the real history of the tragedy of how Native Americans were treated in the United States. And, and correct me and if I'm wrong, but wasn't okay. the mound builder myth, the idea that this was not built by the ancestors of the natives, wasn't that actually cited as a reason to, to relocate people? That's absolutely correct, Flint. The 1830 Indian Removal Act was based in part on this prevailing myth that these these sites with mounds and earthworks and, and, and pyramids and all of these things had actually been created by a lost white race that had been wiped out by these savage Indians. Um, and that it was it was the destruction of that previous lost white race that became the justification for removing people from the land that they had been on for 20,000 years. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just horrible. 
And I want to be really clear, since we're alluding at times to season two of Ancient Apocalypse, we do not believe that Graham Hancock believes these things. He probably is opposed to the removal of people, and he's very opposed to the destruction of these monuments. He writes about that in his book, right? But the reality is, is that belief in some of these ideas has in the past fueled some of these very dark chapters in American history, right? More recent history. That's that's exactly right. And anyone who denies that these misinterpretations of the past uh, have, have been used to oppress minority groups in the United States uh, just doesn't know history. Yeah. And I think that's really important because these ideas do have a history. And as archaeologists, we actually study the history of these ideas as much as we study the archaeological evidence themselves, because that's important. When we test different competing theories on how to interpret the past, it's important to understand the history of archaeological thought. Right. I'm teaching that class this term here at Cardiff University, you know, the how we explain and interpret archaeological evidence. And one of the key points is you need to know the history of the field and the discipline itself to understand what ideas have been proposed, why certain ones have been rejected, why other ones are still believed and whatnot, so that you can actually have that grounding. And then that all connects what happens, what we think of and what we do archaeologically to our own present day and how it has an impact on people in the world around us. That's exactly right. And we change our ideas. Squire and Davis believed in this lost white race. That was part of their their paradigm at the time. But yeah. we now reject that. And actually, one of the most fascinating things to read is an essay written by John Wesley Powell, who is the director of the Smithsonian Institution, in which he basically confesses and says, I believed all of these things that were wrong. He doesn't say these exact words, but he confesses to having believed these wrong things. And then having been persuaded by the archaeological evidence that, in fact, that was not correct. Uh, yeah. And he does this very publicly in a Smithsonian publication in 1897. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. 1897 is way too late. Uh, this is this is decades after the devastation has already happened. And he's saying, "Uh oh, we were wrong. We made a mistake, but we're publishing it now so that people in the future will know that we were wrong. Here's what the real story is. And that's how archaeology works. We we know our horrible history better than anyone else. And yes, parts of it have been horrible, but yeah. we we learn that and we correct it and we try to do the right things as best we can. And we argue with each other about what the right thing to do is. And we, you know, many of us are trying to do the right thing. I would argue a few are not, but I'm not going to name any names right now. There's no reason for that. Um, okay, so shall we move on to Percy Fawcett, everybody's favorite explorer? I'll be a, a quick plug to uh, Movies We Dig, the podcast. I will be uh, covering this movie with them about Percy Fawcett in February, I think. Uh, just just so you know, I taught a, a first-year seminar that was called How to Find a Lost City. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the first book that I have the students read critically is The Lost City of Zed. Okay. Uh, which was the which was the basis for the film. And what people need to understand is that the film is not an accurate representation of the book. And the book is not an accurate representation of the real story. There are multiple layers of problems in the interpretation of, of the reality of Percy Fawcett's story. But it's a really important story to understand, especially because we're coming up on the 100th anniversary next year of his disappearance. Okay, perfect. This is one of the first photographs that was taken of uh, Machu Picchu when Hiram Bingham uh, was encountered the ruins. Now, people will say he discovered Machu Picchu. It's important to note that Hiram Bingham was led to the ruins by an 11 year old boy whose father directed him to take Hiram Bingham up to see these these ruins. So, are you saying that an 11 year old discovered the site? Um, could, could <laughs> be, could, could very well be, but you know, the stories of these kids, uh, you know, leading leading the visitors to see the ruins, uh, are happen all over the world. Um, but the reality is the people who lived there knew about this place and they took mm -hmm. Bingham to see it. And then he reported that he discovered it and the rest of it is, is history. Um, but uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see a photograph that I took uh, at Machu Picchu uh, when I was there in the, I think this was 2002 or so. Um, and if you look at Machu Picchu, there's uh, that, that, that peak that you see, that the highest thing that everybody sees, that's called Huayna Picchu. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are actually ruins up on top of that, uh, up, up up on top of that peak. Uh, and the next slide uh, shows me sitting on those, <laughs> sitting on those on a couple of different occasions when I went I went up to uh, to Machu Picchu. The my first visit was back in 1980. I took these photographs in 2002. But yeah, I've been there and hiked around and have seen it 
firsthand. And it's a really pretty remarkable place. Um, so I just want to get across from this kind of image, just the sense that if you compare this that Hiram Bingham took to what you took, you can just see how much effort has been expended by archaeologists and conservators and site managers to be able to preserve and present these ruins for people that go and visit, right? It's not something that's just untouched and that you can go there as a tourist and actually start analyzing. You need to dig into the archives, into older photos, into older uh, documentation and notes and records about what it, what it looked like before conservation and preservation and presentation actually occurred. That's exactly right. And this is one of the world's favorite destinations for, for travel. But the way that it looks is thanks to archaeologists. Archaeologists yeah. dug that up. Archaeologists restored it. Archaeologists are the ones who made it a place that you can go and visit. Um, and next slide is, you know, there's a lot of discussion online about uh, megalithic architecture of the Incas. Um, and this is a place that I, that uh, Percy Fawcett visited. He went to Cusco, he visited Sacsayhuaman, and he became convinced in his mind that this was the remnants of an ancient civilization that had existed across South America. And when he goes into the Amazon, he's actually looking for stuff like this. He he thinks that it's he's going to find uh, similar he's going to find similar types of architecture. But you know. This is amazing stonework. It's amazing, oh, yeah. amazing constructions. And we can talk about, you know, how it was that these were done. Um, and people still are kind of their minds are blown that that the Incas were able to work stone in this fashion. But but they were. It's right there. And yeah. we've done excavations. We find and the and the, the the artifacts that we found find around these are Inca artifacts. Um, and it's not so, just people in the Incas. People all over the world have come up with ingenious ways to use tools that I would never want to use while doing stonework, but they had the time, know-how, expertise to be able to do a ph phenomenal stonework all over the world because it's something that if, you, if you're if you trained in how to do it, you develop your local traditions of how to do it, you have your tools and, and you get it done. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, it, and, you know, using Occam's razor, that it was not done with, it was not done with lasers. It was not, it was not done with, you know, with high to ancient high technology. It was done with a lot of elbow grease, a lot of hard work. Yeah. Uh, and in particular, a form of labor organization that the Incas had that was called Mita labor, which was actually a labor tax that provided them with an unlimited amount of unskilled labor uh, to people to just wail away on these rocks and, and carve them however they wanted to carve them. This, this is done through massive organization of human labor. That was the technology, was how the labor was organized, not coming up with lasers or some, or liquid that melts rock or anything like that. Which this, just to give another call back to a video on my channel, we discussed this exact same topic, how ancient people were just amazing managers, you know, project managers. Dale Simpson Jr., our video on Easter Island and the stonework there, it's just, you know, it's amazing to be able to think through the social organization that it takes to be able to do this. And that's what's impressive. And that's what we're working to uncover when we do this kind of our archaeological investigation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to continue to the story of Percy Fawcett, the next slide, so the things that he was familiar with. He went to Tiwanaku. He, 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 he did exploration around Highland Bolivia. He saw these ruins. Um, and it stimulated his imagination, as it would anyone's. I mean, that's that's really not surprising at all. This is the the famous uh, Gateway of the Sun at Tiwanaku in in Bolivia, um, and you know there are a lot of different interpretations of it, and a lot of misinterpretations of it. In fact, it has a a long, long history of really bizarre interpretations of what Tiwanaku uh, represented. What does this represent in the up, an updated view on it? What's the leading one or two hypotheses? Well, the, the central deity is a figure that's sometimes referred to as the, as the gateway deity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably a solar deity. And, and all of those squares right. that you see on either side are, are probably representations that have uh, something to do with uh, calendrical observations. In fact, uh, we know that uh, Tiwanaku was a place for astronomical observations of the movement of the sun between the solstices. Um, and that they actually had a calendar. And so this, I think, is a combination of a representation of some calendrics but also representation of the social organization of the of the different groups that were uh -huh. organized at Tiwanaku for accomplishing uh, various tasks. Um, See, that so, was a perfect tie-in right there. <laughs> so, so yeah, this is this is sort of a, a a representation in stone of the social organization that was used to carve the and move these stones. Yeah. So, so it, it all it all ties together.
Um, and then this is, is Pumapunku, which a lot of people refer to as if it were a different archaeological site than Tiwanaku, but it's not. This is a district of Tiwanaku. It's all part of the same urban complex. Okay. Um, but the reason why people are so confused by these stones is that they've been moved around a lot. Uh, in fact, the Spanish mined Tiwanaku for stones uh, that they then used to create the, the city of La Paz, Bolivia. They actually built a railroad to carry oh. the stones from Tiwanaku uh, to La Paz so that they could construct roads and cathedrals and things like that. So they were moving the stones around. The, the, the stones are really not in their original locations, which is why they're so confusing, but they're like puzzle pieces. You know, they, they represent amazing stone masonry. Uh, and, and it's long before the Incas. You know, this dates to around 700, 800 CE or so, which is not quite a century before the Incas. But but the Incas recognize this as being ancestral to them. But the, the Inca stone masonry has its ancestry in the stone masonry of Tiwanaku. But they were using techniques, and this is mostly andesite and sandstone. It's not granite. And it was probably worked through something called rotary milling and the use of abrasives, not lasers, not steel saws or anything like that, not not liquid that melted stone. Um, but it is an, an amazing representation of the power of human labor organization. Yeah. And it also is clear that we have different chronological phases to this. It's not like everything just appears out of nowhere. We can see development over time and change over time. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But anyway, Percy Fawcett visited these places. He saw this amazing stonework. He it was his mind was blown. He thought that this was represented an ancient civilization. And he was working in the early 20th century before we had radiocarbon dating, uh before we even had um I mean tree reading reading dating was just being developed, but it wasn't um it wasn't being used in in South America. Uh but Fawcett was an explorer and he mapped places. Um, and this next slide, of course, people are probably familiar with the books and the film, uh, but they need to be looked at critically because they don't tell the real story of, of, of Percy Fawcett. He was hired by the governments of Brazil, uh, Bolivia, and Peru to map their border areas. Okay, One, Among the things that he did was he, he helped establish where the boundaries of these countries were in mm. deep deep within the rainforest. And here you can see one of his expeditions. I think I've got another photograph of one of his other expeditions. These were later published by his notes after his disappearance were published by his son, Brian, uh, who published these you know, photographs as well as the drawings, some of which are really pretty um, sensational. Uh, the next illustration, for example, is one of these huge anacondas that they encountered. <laughs> Lots of our, our tropes of the Amazon come from stories of Fawcett. That's how people learned about it. Uh, he also was an incredible racist. Uh, the depictions of indigenous people are um, are misrepresentations. Here's an, yet another example of somebody re being represented as if they were almost a, a giant. Um, but he actually, if you look at the person depicted on the right, the illustrations make them look like they're not human. And Fawcett and of course the the white explorers were armed. Uh, they were they they've got their guns there. <clears throat> clearly superior uh, no, yeah and i mean not. you can even see this in the cranial structure with the sloping forehead and the strong jaw it's very clearly intended to to dehumanize these group of people well that's exactly right and fawcett was using the same story of these uh these kind of savage people who had driven away the earlier civilization and that was why they were so you know so violent well they weren't so violent they understood how to live in this environment. He's the one who got all the parasites. He's the one who was constantly starving. He's the one who was nearly died several times because he didn't. He wasn't adapted to this environment. Yeah. Uh, whereas they were walking around with hardly any clothes on, and they were doing fine. Uh, yeah. But anyway, Fawcett explored, and he was an explorer. He was a geographer. He 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 worked for the Royal Geographic Society. Uh, he was given a medal for his work. Uh, and he did map a lot of really important areas of, of, of the Amazon. But there's a problem with that. OK, this next slide shows the legacy of Fawcett's mapping. OK, this is a, a recent map uh, that shows the areas of burning and deforestation in the rainforest. Um, and an analysis of Fawcett's mapping projects and Fawcett's expeditions will show you that exactly the places that Fawcett went to and mapped are the places where the most deforestation and the biggest fires in the Amazon are happening today. That's what Fawcett's legacy is, just massive destruction of the rainforest, which actually leads to the discovery of archaeological sites. A lot of these amazing things that are being that we're discovering or finding in, in the Amazon uh, basin are happening because of this conversion 
of tropical rainforest to pasture lands, yeah. okay, which was exposing archaeological sites. Now, to Fawcett's credit, I mean, he ultimately disappears, unfortunately, and we don't hear from him again, if you'll see some of the headlines that were associated with his, his exploration. Um, and these are from 100 years ago. In, in fact, uh, he promoted his expeditions by, uh, nice. by, by contracting with the Los Angeles Times for, so they could be uh, reporting exclusively on, on his exploration. And you'll see this is from 1925. Okay, mm -hmm. but look at how it's being described. Okay, South American jungle may hide lost race. Explorer hopes to unravel puzzles of history. Norse gods, Alaskan deities known to Indians. Okay, saying that Norse gods were known to the Indians, that's an allusion to these superior Nordic races. You know, this is this is a, a, a racist expedition. He believes South America, not Euphrates, is the yeah. cradle of civilization. <laughs> okay, we're seeing these tropes again. These are being revived in the context of a new Netflix series, which is going to say that, in fact, you know, there were ancient civilizations of the Americas that may help us understand human history. Well, that's true, but these civilizations were occurring all over the world. Uh, but headlines like this, explorers enter jungles to seek lost white race. You know, and notice this, this trope right here where they actually pose as gods, right? This whole idea of colonists coming and they are greeted as gods the more and more evidence comes out that it's actually the europeans that chose to present themselves as gods if you see what i mean and it's that's very exactly clear right. right here that's ex it couldn't be more clear that's that's exactly right but Fawcett was also deluded by fake artifacts this is actually a carved object that was given to him by a, a, a science fiction writer named h Ryder haggard uh but i in retrospect i think haggard was pulling his leg uh, Haggard sort of suggested that this might have come from the lost continent of Atlantis that with links to Amazonia. Uh, and he didn't tell Fawcett that it was fake. And I think Fawcett bought it. Uh, we don't know what happened to the object, but he may have carried it with him on his expeditions. Uh, but anybody who's familiar with Egyptian art or inscriptions can see that that, that whole thing was totally fake. So Fawcett is going in pursuit of something that's in his imagination, not something that's real. And he's doing it in colonialist ways, uh, that ultimately result in the destruction of the Amazon rainforest, and he disappears. In 1925, his expedition, which is himself, his 21-year-old son, and his son's 21-year-old friend, um, disappear. Um, and of course, it's, you know, the news makes a big deal of it because he had contracted with the Los Angeles Times to tell his story, and the whole yeah. world was watching, and then he disappears. This becomes a, a sort of a classic story of, of, of the disappearing explorer. And there's a lot of speculation, including in the movie, about what he found. You know, did he go native? Did he did he wind up living with the indigenous people? Did he really discover his lost city? Did he find some path into a, a hollow earth and continue living, you know, in, in what it was that he was <laughs> seeking? Or, and here's where Occam's razor applies, did he offend the people who were living there? by begging them for food when he himself was starving? Did he fail to bring gifts to exchange to them for their willingness to let him explore their lands or their territories? Uh, and did the people who live there ultimately get pissed off enough at Fawcett that they kill him? Yeah. Um, that that seems to be the, the story of what happened, is, is that ultimately he and, and sadly, his son and his son's friend were, were, were killed by, by the people who lived there uh, because they got fed up with this colonialist white explorer who thought he was superior to them. There was one more slide in that series, Flint, which actually oh, sure. shows uh, the reality, the archaeological reality of what it was that was inspiring Fawcett, which is something that we now know. Thanks to the years of dedicated hard work in the rainforest of the Upper Shingu uh, by archaeologist Michael Heckenberger at the University of Florida, we actually know that there were large settlements in the Upper Shingu. Uh, mm -hmm. including a place called Kuhikugu, um, which was uh, a large, well-organized village, which was probably the place that Fawcett was headed to. You know, he heard rumors, he heard stories uh, of these large settlements. Well, there's a there's a truth to that. There were large settlements in the Upper Shingu. Uh, and we now know that, in fact, a large part of the Amazon was occupied by people who were farmers, uh, was occupied by 
uh, people who were growing their own food, living in large, well-organized villages. So there wasn't a lost city of white people. There were these very well-organized indigenous villages, uh, which are these still from? there today. That's that's one that still exists today. People are living there right now. Uh -huh, so um, they're fairly recent even. Well, it's a pattern that is 2,000 years old. Okay. Uh, people are people are still following patterns very similar to what we're now finding uh, in terms of archaeological remains. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. So to jump mm -hmm. forward in time, you think about this trope of exploration in a sense, and now we have new tools to be able to look underground, even to you know remote sensing and lidar. And so I think it's important to think about a different way of seeing the past that we can use today in the 21st century. So let's think about this LIDAR, and I guess the, you want to start off with the Lost City of the Monkey God? Yeah, well, that's something that a lot of people know because uh, Douglas Preston's book was was a, a bestseller. Lost City of the Monkey God is, is actually um, not a very accurate description of what was actually there. Uh, there was no yes. monkey god. There was no lost city, but it's something that everybody kind of heard about through through popular books. Uh, this is the uh, archaeological site of Karakol, which one of one of the first locations of the use of lidar and in uncovering information about Maya settlements. Lidar is one of those things that has completely transformed the amount of detail that we now have about uh, sites in uh, Mexico and Central America. Um, I first visited Tikal back in 1988, and here you can see what the landscape looks like. Uh, only small portions of Tikal uh, have been prepared for tourists. Uh, they've had the, the the trees removed from them, but it was enormous site that covered a, a huge amount of area. I can't remember exactly how many square kilometers. We are now seeing much more of what's there as the result of the work of Marcello Canuto, Francisco Estrada Belli, uh, a, a number of their uh, uh, their graduate students, Carlos Fernandez Diaz, uh, who is the principal uh, lidar researcher. And among the things that they are giving us, uh, and this is an article that was published in 2018, okay, mm -hmm. people can go and read it and look at it, is revealing an enormous amount of information about places like Tikal. LIDAR essentially is a technology that allows us to remove the vegetation and look at the surface features, which are exposing roads, structures, plazas, um, and other features. And in fact, uh, the work that's being done by Marcello Canuto and his team uh, is revealing an enormous amount of information about the ancient Mayas. Uh, additional work is being done at places like El Mirador by Richard Hansen, uh, where we have enormous pyramids uh, with plaster ornamentation. Uh, here you get a sense of just one little piece of that ornamentation on a huge structure. Um, and here's an artist's reconstruction of what that looks like. But under LIDAR, this is a, uh, a map of the major structures in the center of El Mirador that have been imposed on top of uh, the LIDAR imagery. Uh, that is revealing to us the, the urban nature of these of these sites. Um, and it's really pretty remarkable. Um, we see evidence for uh, extensive agriculture. We now know that they were terracing and using uh, ridged fields in order to produce enormous amounts of food. Um, we have at Tikal over 700 structures per square kilometer with an urban core density of 1,000 to 2,000 people. Uh, we actually uh, have enormous information on roads that connected sites, including over 106 linear kilometers of causeways, uh, some of which are 22 kilometers long, and lots of evidence for defensive fortifications. There are bridges, there are ditches and moats, ramparts, stone walls, terraces. Uh, we can see enormous amounts of detail as a result of this, which gives us a lot of information about monumental architecture. Now, this goes all the way back to the earliest known Mayas. Uh, and one of the most remarkable sites is this site called Aguara Phoenix. What okay. period we're talking 1000 to 350 BC? Yeah, we're going okay. we're going all the way back to about 1000 BC, which is actually uh, the period when we it's it's difficult to say whether they were Mayas or Olmecs. So I think this is important. So we have this picture of what's not been excavated, and it gives us this larger picture of the region of these settlements and things like that. How do we get these dates though? How do we know it's not some lost civilization from the Ice Age that this LIDAR is, is, is relating to? The LIDAR, and this is an important thing to keep in mind, LIDAR is, is helping us to discover new features and new things, but LIDAR is mostly confirming what archaeologists had already thought, but amplifying it. We knew that Tikal was a big urban center. Now we're just blown away by just how dense it was because we can see many more features. Uh, it's not something we hadn't thought before. People have known or Tikal was a, was a big site since the beginning of the 20th century. Um, but LIDAR is 
filling in lots more of those details. So and it's that, like that's... adding a few pieces to a puzzle that slot in exactly in the right shape to actually match up with what we knew about some of this urban fabric, but expanding it in a big way. Expanding it in a big way and actually kind of blowing us away with how large these populations were. That's that's one of the main things that comes from these LIDAR surveys. So they found uh, 60,000 features in, in a small sample of, of, the, of the whole Maya area. So we, we now know that this was much more densely populated uh, than, than we had thought before because of what our technology was. We, I mean, walking around and looking at the rainforest and mapping sites that we can find on the surface is a, is a, is a great methodology. But if you have LIDAR, you have an even better methodology for doing that. And then you yeah. have to go back and ground truth what it is that you see in the LIDAR imagery. Exactly. And in many ways, this phrase I always use all the time is from the known to the unknown. And so that's how we're proceeding in all these cases. We're taking what we know, and then we're expanding on that towards what we don't know using by walking around, by using LIDAR, and then by ground truthing everything we find by doing some excavations in some spots to make sure that it matches up with what we think it looked like from this kind of remote sensing or what we saw on the surface. Right. But one of the things that's very important to keep in mind, when you look at these articles that have been published, they all have long strings of names of authors. This work requires a huge amount of effort by a large number of people, including yeah. uh, engineers who do the LIDAR, including archaeologists who do the image interpretation, and then people like Francisco Estrada Belli, who actually go and do the hard work of driving around in the rainforest uh, and ground truthing these sites, which is, which is incredibly difficult to do. These are not easy landscapes to work in. It, it's quite challenging to do this type of field work. Yeah, uh, and and also very expensive. So again, another another plea for more funding, another plea <laughs> for more money to do this. Uh, is Netflix, that if you're it, listening, we could do a show that could actually fund real research. It it, it takes <laughs> takes a lot. It takes a lot of money to go back and ground truth all of these things, and more of that needs to be done. Yeah, more of that needs to be done. We actually are learning things that we did not know before. Um, Perfect. That as as a result of lidar, and this is thanks uh, to. Uh, the hard work of uh, Takeshi Inomata uh, and his team. You'll also see the name of Juan Carlos Fernandez Diaz there, who's who's the lidar engineer who's been making the imagery. Uh, but we're what we're finding in in places like uh, Tabasco, Mexico, um, are settlements that had not been mapped before, settlements that had not been documented, um, and these include places like Aguada Phoenix, where here in this aerial photograph you can see the massive architecture. You can see these incredible platforms. Well, no, you actually can't, okay? <laughs> because because this is this is an aerial photograph. When you use LIDAR, this is what it looks like, okay? Mm. You're able to see amazing structures. There were the remains of amazing structures, including large rectangular uh, plazas uh, and including uh, mounds and pyramids. Uh, but notice how linear they are, okay? Mm -hmm. why, are, why are they being laid out almost as if they were being laid out on a grid? Uh, well, that was happening because of astronomy, okay? Um, there are some researchers who will say, well, archeologists don't care about astronomy. That's bullshit. We do care about astronomy. We've been studying ast astronomy for as long as we've been looking at places like Stonehenge. Uh, but the reason why these places look the way they do is that they were aligned to astronomical observations. And those astronomical observations were tied to agriculture. Uh, mm -hmm. And these are things that we understand by doing comparative analysis. Um, but among the kinds of things that have been revealed are not only the existence of these amazing ceremonial complexes, and the ceremonies were based on the calendar. They were, the ceremonies were based upon astronomical observations. And these surveys along larger and larger areas, and this is just a sample of, of the number of sites that have been found, are revealing this pattern over and over and over again at lots of different sites. And, and I have to emphasize that. It's not just one lost city someplace. We're talking about hundreds of archaeological sites, many of which have been mapped in enormous detail and are showing patterns. And the patterns that we're seeing is mounds that are aligned with astronomical observations. The astronomical observations are aligned with the agricultural calendar. They're not all pointing to the same thing. In fact, some of the studies have shown that there's variation. You know, mm -hmm. at this early stage in Maya civilization, uh, different sites were kind of doing slightly different orientations. Uh, but ultimately, the idea is to have structures that align with the observation of things like where the sun rises on the horizon so that you know it's a good time to plant, uh, uh -huh, yeah. because that way you'll be taking advantage of the rains and you'll have the maximum harvest. So these ceremonies were associated with agriculture for the purpose of maximizing food production 
which then underwrote the growth of even larger populations. Mm -hmm. um, and over time, this process, which lasts for thousands of years, uh, is one in which uh, the calendar becomes a central part of these uh, of, of Maya civilization. Okay, because it's tied to agriculture and because it has this long legacy uh, in this yeah, ancient that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Something else that's happening with LIDAR, which is really pretty amazing, is that we know now about connections between Teotihuacan, which is a massive ancient city uh, about 30 kilometers north of Mexico, and the city of Tikal, 700 kilometers to the south. Mm -hmm. Now, we've long known about connections between these two cities, but what LIDAR has been able to reveal, and actually, I'll mention how important uh, the, the the astronomical alignments are, and actually, I'm going to refer here again, uh, just a plug for, for what it is that we have looked at and what we have known. This is a term paper that I wrote in college in 1977. This was a paper about archaeoastronomy or mm -hmm. astroarchaeology, it was called at the time. So anybody who says archaeologists are not interested in astronomy, here's proof, an evidence-based argument. I was interested in astronomy in 1977, <laughs> uh, and other archaeologists were too. Uh, but Teotihuacan is this enormous uh, city in central Mexico, and we know that it was now also laid out according to astronomical alignments. In fact, when you look at the layout of the city of Teotihuacan, it's on a grid because they were making solar observations, because they were tied intimately to the movements of the sun, observations of the calendar. Uh, and this is something that we now know from, from documented in even more detail from, from LIDAR. So so this is something Ivan Sprock, who's, a, who's an amazing archaeoastronomer, uh, has been able to document where it is that the sun rises, where it is the sun sets, how it is that the grid of the city was laid out according to these astronomical observations. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, this is something archaeologists have known for a long time, but we're getting more and more and more detail on it by using LIDAR. It's almost like a lot of people in the public have not taken many archaeology courses in, at the university level, and they just assume that we do and don't do certain things. I mean, it's, it's how I started off my conversation on Joe Rogan. It's just the reality is, is that people don't really understand the average public does not understand what 21st century archaeology is and just how interdisciplinary it is and all the different kinds of questions we ask. And so there's these kind of assumptions that we don't do these things when in fact we are doing these things. We explore the jungle. We go underwater. We look at astronomical alignments. This is exactly what archaeologists have been doing for a long time. Well, that's exactly right. And that map that I showed of Teotihuacan was a result of the Teotihuacan mapping project. Mm -hmm. That was done in the 1950s and 60s. You know, yeah. we've known about this stuff for, for decades, uh, generations. It is often being presented as new. But, you know, the new part of it is that the public is just becoming aware of some of these things because they don't take those archaeology courses. It's, it's not new because archaeologists don't know about it. And actually, I want to put a plug in here for archaeologists. We have been trying to grab people by the collar and say, pay attention to this. Look at these cool things that we know. Look at what we've discovered. Um, it, it's not our fault that the public has not been paying attention. Uh, well, we I think we can do a better job at using different uh, media. This is why I'm, I have this YouTube channel. There are not many actual archaeologists that are professional and have decades of experience with there's a few don't get me wrong andy white has one and his, the title of his channel is nobody listens to andy right <laughs> and so don't get me wrong there are some people and bloggers like carl fegans and andre kostopoulos and and others but it, it is it, it is something that i think that archaeology has a challenge with uh, I give talks at universities on outreach and public engagement and stuff like that. And in my experience, archaeologists are very keen and very good at reaching younger people um, with museum events and, and on-site events and opportunities for younger people. They're pretty good at, meeting, at, at reaching retired people as well. But reaching sort of people in between those ages, let's say from 15 to 60, it's really difficult. It's it's a challenge to reach those kinds of people, particularly the ones that are interested in archaeology, which there's lots of them. And what they have greater accessibility to is what's on Netflix and what's on, what's promoted to them in uh, sort of less uh, academic media, let's say, that does not represent what we actually do very, very well. That's right, Flint. 30 years ago, um, I was writing and, and publishing and trying to get archaeologists interested in something that was called the World Wide Web. <clears throat> I was actually urging archaeologists to put their work on the web, to create websites, to create blogs, to put their information out there. 
Uh, I, I've been doing that for 30 years now. Um, yeah. You know, as the technology increases, it becomes more accessible. Uh, but I realized 30 years ago that a lot of this cool stuff could only be found in university libraries. It was only mm -hmm. something you would learn in university classes. In fall of 1996, I was the first faculty member at the University of Kansas to put my course materials online for anybody in the world to access who had a web browser, because I realized this information needs to go out to the public. And yeah. I would get emails from people in Malaysia saying, oh, Professor Hobbs, thanks so much for putting your course materials online because we can now study this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and there were people who in Eastern Europe who were looking at my stuff on the Mayas. But you know what happened, Flint? Mm. And this is this is a problem, is that universities put that stuff behind paywalls. Uh, they yeah. got us to put it on Blackboard. They got us to put it on Canvas. They did not want us to be making all of this available to the rest of the world. They wanted proprietary course material so that they could charge tuition for students to take those and, classes. And, and this is the key point. We need, to, we need point. to free that information. We and need, this is we the need key to take point. it out it's, of the classroom. It's not the fault. Well, it's partly the fault of archaeologists, but it's, it's largely the fault of the university system. And it's largely the fault of academic publication systems designed for profit, sometimes for non-profit, profitable non-profits. But uh, at the same time, it is very clearly designed in that way. That's why academics, we do not get credit or promotion or raises for doing public engagement. We get that for doing teaching and research, right? And so there's so many limitations to doing this that it becomes a, a real burden, particularly in today's world where it requires constant investment of time and energy to update stuff. Uh, but before we move on, I wanna put in one real big plug for this event that we are hosting October 25th to 27th called Real Archaeology, hashtag Real Archaeology. We're gonna have several dozen online archaeology creators, bloggers, TikTokers, YouTubers, podcasters, everybody we can get to be doing engagement on that day to celebrate Archaeology Month hosted by the Archaeological Institute of America. So 25th to 27th of this month or in October, everybody check it out. Our website is real-archaeology.com. So check it great. out. Yeah. Great, great, great name. Well, I'm, <laughs> I, I know our time is getting short, Flint, so I want to talk about just a couple more things. Getting back to this theme of Teotihuacan, not only did we know that Teotihuacan was laid out according to this astronomical grid, but here's one of the amazing things that's come up from LIDAR just recently. And actually, this is among the things that we are finding about uh, Teotihuacan and Tikal, 700 kilometers away, is that there were structures that were astronomically aligned from Teotihuacan that were actually being duplicated at Tikal by people from Teotihuacan. And this is something that is being revealed that actually there was architectural architectural layouts that are characteristic of Teotihuacan that were being duplicated at Tikal. And this is something that we found from very kind of subtle signatures in, in, in LIDAR. Uh, but this is an example on the left of a LIDAR image from Tikal in central Guatemala that is duplicating the architectural layout of a, of a structure that's astronomically aligned at Teotihuacan. Wow. Um, and then here's where the multidisciplinary comes in, the ground truthing. OK, not only is this structure there, but archaeological excavations at Tikal have turned up fragments of pottery that came from Teotihuacan style incense burners. Huh. So go. So identifying the compound, going there and doing the excavations, uh, archaeologist Steve Houston has been able to find actual Teotihuacan objects at Tikal as a result of what was discovered in the LIDAR survey. And, and, this, and this is key. Is, this is not just asking questions. This is having a hypothesis, ground truthing it, and then coming up with multiple lines of evidence to be able to demonstrate it. Yeah, right? that's, that's, so that's exactly right. It's a problem-oriented archaeology that is being done specifically to, to test a particular hypothesis, which is how we roll. That, that's mm -hmm. how we work. That's how we do what we do. On the theme of identifying these astronomical alignments, uh, the work of Ivan Sprite has been amazing. Uh, among the things that he's been able to to document is that these layouts, these rectangular um, features, were actually oriented with 20 structures around their sides. Okay, you can see those numbered from 1 through 20. Those correspond to units on the ancient Maya calendar. <laughs> um, and this is something that's being duplicated at site after site after site. But we're now able to come up with amazing details of how the architecture reflected the astronomy, which reflected the calendar, which actually was tied to social organization. And that mm -hmm. each of these units was probably something that was attended to or managed by a different segment of society. 
um, and that all of this was oriented towards their cosmology, towards understanding where they were in the world. But look at the incredible detail that's coming out of this research. Well, this is something that's going to take a long time to filter out to the public, except that we're telling you about it right now. <laughs> but, it, but it's, it's incredible. Right cool. Yeah, right, right here. You're, you're learning about incredible things that you really should, should know more about. Uh, but we know about it in a lot of detail. And this is something that, um, you know, sometimes the general public gets turned off by the amount of detail. They don't they don't want to, to look at all of the intricate elements of the Mesoamerican calendar. Uh, and that's fine. Not everybody needs to learn how the Maya calendar works. But archaeologists know, and we get into the detail, uh, yeah. sometimes in really obsessive ways. Uh, but among the kinds of things that we see are these patterns that we can recognize at particular sites. And we can see, and this is something Ivan uh, Sprike has been doing, is, is we can see these alignments. We can figure out the exact dates on which those alignments took place. Hmm. You see 11 February, 29 October. These pyramid complexes were being set up to observe very specific things that were happening. Yeah. Um, and these were... Uh, appearances of the sun on the horizon, which told you when to plant your crops so that you could get maximum production of them. But but these are the kinds of details that archaeologists get into, is looking at the specific alignments, figuring out the particular dates, um, and, and being able to do this at dozens of archaeological sites based on this detailed LIDAR information. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's something we see at place after place after place. There's not just one lost city. There's not just one lost civilization. In fact, we what we see is a number of different places that are actually sort of competing with each other for who's going to tell the best story or who's going to do this the best or who has who has the best structures or things like that. And they're not all the same. OK, yeah. this graph shows you the variability. They're not looking at just the same thing. They're looking at a bunch of different things. And then over time, some become dominant and some become ones that people forget and don't do. And that's how calendars and and, and civilizations change over time. Uh, but they were making observations of where the sun rose. They were making observations of where the sun set. But it's complicated, okay? It's not just a simple equation. Uh, there, there is a lot of variation to that. And getting into the weeds is literally and figuratively what archaeologists do with this stuff. We, we yeah. get into the weeds and, and we look at the details of calendrics and astronomy. Uh, and, and it's yet, not just are... based off of one site or one building, it's based off of thousands. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we're looking at it for Olmecs, we're looking at it for Mayas, but if people are interested in the Maya calendar and astronomy, here's where you find it. This is a an amazing article uh, written by three different archaeoastronomers who have been able to synthesize this information and come up with new interpretations of how these calendar systems begin, how the Mesoamerican and Maya calendar started. There's just fantastic new science that's being done by revisiting things, looking at them in detail, getting into the weeds, both both really getting into the weeds, because rainforest research is not easy, uh, and also getting into all of these details, um, yeah. which, which becomes really important. So one of the things that always strikes me when you think about dating stuff using archaeoastronomy, which Graham Hancock and a lot of other people try to do, they try to say it has this orientation, which means it must date to this period based on sort of, you know, the procession or something like that, right? Right. And it, it strikes me that that's very much a circular argument because you're making an assumption about where what it's pointing at, when in fact with the sky, it could be pointing at a lot of different stuff that based on the procession or declination or whatever can change seasonally or annually or over millennia. And so what we really need to use is one something that's fixed in time, which is we know that it dates to this period in time, and then we can look at where it's pointing, if you see what I mean, archaeoastronomically. Archaeoastro we well, can't and, do and both we, at the same time. Well, and we also, and this is really super important, Flint, we also tie it to social complexity, social systems, how it was that these societies were organized, what they were doing agriculturally, what they were concerned with in terms of their own cosmology. It, it's not just finding a date or saying, oh, yeah, the thinks is looking at this. It, it has to be within the larger context of understanding how these how these ancient societies functioned. And that's that's where we get into the weeds. That's where the details really matter. And that's why it's key to go from that known to that unknown. You take what you know about a society, you take what you understand from excavations, and then you can look at what these you know, orientations and how they might relate to the sky. Yeah, that's exactly right. But I wanted to talk about another, another recent discovery, or actually recent documentation. I, I really like to use the term 
document additional documentation. I mean, there are discoveries that take place, but a lot of this is happening as a result of just getting lots more detail about mm -hmm. things that we already knew about. Um, and this is the, the work uh, that's being done by uh, Stephen Rostan and, and his team in Ecuador, who have uh, been able to explore sites in the upper Amazon. In the Amazonian portion of Ecuador, you can see a little inset map in the upper left that gives you a sense of what this study area is along the Upanto River, um, where archaeological sites with large structures have been known for 20 years or more. This is something an archaeologist uh, published, uh, actually goes back to the 1970s. But what uh, Rostan and his team are doing is looking at these sites. He's been doing research there for decades, looking at these sites using LIDAR. And among the th kinds of things that they're finding is more information about these larger contexts. OK, what, mm -hmm. what, what really matters is not only just the structures, but also the agricultural systems that supported the society that built them. And among the kinds of things, you know, he gets a lot of attention for finding the monumental architecture, but he's also finding these ridged and drained fields, mm -hmm. uh, which which indicate where the agriculture was taking place. Now, and this we've is like 500 about, BC around that time. Yeah, roughly that, although some of them go back quite a bit farther. Uh, but we've known about these big structures in South America for a long time. You know, Ciudad Perdida in Colombia would be an example of that. Uh, but here in the Upanto Valley, uh, Stephen Rostan has been able to uh, kind of document and explore these sites. Obviously, by removing the vegetation, you can actually see them. A lot of this area was covered by dense rainforest until the farmers began uh, removing the trees and, and exposing the structures. But now that we have LIDAR, we can actually see lots more details. Okay, Here you're seeing those same structures. But among the things that Stephen Rostan and his group have been identifying are roads Okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and sites that are connected to each other. Um, and then going and ground truthing where it was that these roads went and what they look like and what you're look you're lo looking here at one of these deep roads uh, and here's what it looks like in lidar okay it's mm -hmm. connecting several different structures and sites and these sites are huge these layouts are 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 really big and significant okay yeah. here's a comparison of the Giza plateau on the left and Teotihuacan on the right and what you're looking at in the middle is the site of Quilamope and the main mm -hmm. complex and where the roads lead to another, okay? These sites in Ecuador are as large as, as sites in Egypt and, and in Mexico, uh, which, is, which is something that's really pretty incredible. Um, the more information we look at, the more we understand what, what's going on here. Yeah, I think that um, makes sense. Well, I also wanna talk about something else, and I know that this is going to be featured in um, season two of Ancient Apocalypse, uh, which seems to, from the trailer, at least have a focus on Amazonia. Uh, and among the things that archaeologists know about Amazonia is that there's a lot there uh, that we have known about, but we are getting lots more detail on, okay? Uh, and this includes information about food production as well as structures, okay? Now, the trope of unknown Amazonia has been around for a long time. We talked about Percy Fawcett earlier, uh, kind of deepest, darkest Amazonia, but I want to emphasize here that in 2001, okay, 23 years ago, um, <laughs> there was a major exhibition at the British Museum about the Amazon, okay? So the Amazon was unknown, at least for the public, in 2001. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's very weird in 2024 to be saying the, uh, that the Amazon is still unknown because archaeologists have been busy during those past 23 years doing lots of archaeology. It's um, a phrase that I imagine is going to persist even further, though, John. Come on, let's be honest. It's a trope that sells tickets and it gets eyeballs, and so therefore it will be used. Well, absolutely. And we have unknown Egypt and unknown Greece. You know, all, mm -hmm. in spite of enormous amounts of archaeological research, we're not ever going to know everything. Uh, but among the kinds of things that we are learning is with the analysis of things like starch grains, we can identify the specific foods that we people were producing. And we can see patterns in the distribution of those. Okay, we know that maize, for example, travels from Mexico down to South America. We also now know that cacao, the basis for making chocolate, mm -hmm. is it is it something that was domesticated in Ecuador and travels from Ecuador and the Amazon up into Central America and uh, Central America and Mexico. That's using phytoliths, right? Am I wrong, or is that using seeds? Ah, well, here's the, here's the fun thing, Flint. It's using multiple lines of evidence. Okay. It's using phytoliths. It's using pollen. 
It's using residue analysis. It's using DNA, huh. um, and it's using the, the the context, which is which is the pottery that was used for preparing these. Okay, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. multiple lines of evidence that are helping to tell this story, not just one. A that bunch of different yeah. lines of evidence. What we have known, and actually this is something you can tell from these black and white photographs, is that it was in the 1960s that a geographer named uh, Bill Dinovan uh, recognized that there was a modification of landscape that was taking place, uh, something that were called camellones. These are raised and drained fields that he recognized in Colombia. Um, and we now know from, from LIDAR and other types of surveys that extensive areas of lowland, of wet lowlands in South America were under cultivation. They hmm. had been modified by people in order to make these raised, drained fields uh, that were extremely productive. Okay. Uh, obviously, because they were so productive, they became overgrown by rainforest. But people like Clark Erickson uh, have been able to I show that not yeah. only were yeah, Clark Erickson, who recently retired from the University of Pennsylvania, amazing archaeologist, was able to document these raised and drained field systems in Bolivia. But among the things that Clark was able to demonstrate is not only were they raising crops on them, they were using the canals to raise fish. Mm. Uh, and the, and these were these were also pisciculture sites where people were were, were raising huge quantities of fish in addition to uh, the, the various agricultural crops. Um, and here you can sort of get a sense of what what this cultivated landscape might have looked like, it was incredibly productive. And it was this agricultural production that was occurring in Bolivia. It was occurring in, in, in Colombia. We actually now know that it was happening in Panama. Mm -hmm. And here you can see some, some, some satellite images that show these rain and ridge fields in Panama. I've written on some of Clark's work in the article that I wrote on why we study food, right? Because it's one of the good examples of how we can try to recover uh, techniques for food production in the past that can actually help us think about how to how to adapt to climate change that's going on now. And so looking at traditional agriculture uh, in many places here in, in Greece and elsewhere, we're realizing that traditional agricultural practices were much more productive than we thought. They're, they're in some cases, they're more productive than industrial agriculture per unit of land, maybe not per uh, unit of labor. You know, I talked about this also with Dale Simpson Jr. with lithic mulching is another one of these techniques that people are realizing that you can use in arid environments and dry environments. And we're starting to introduce it in different places to be able to, to deal with, uh, you know, our challenges to food production in the face of climate change. Yeah, absolutely. And among the kinds of things that are happening with this archaeological research is that we are discovering and able to to revive uh, agricultural techniques that are environmentally sustainable, don't require a lot in the way of fertilizers or chemicals or or, or heavy equipment. Um, and this is something that Alan Collada was actually able to recreate and restore uh, some of these drained uh, raised fields in Bolivia and was able to demonstrate that they actually were more productive than the yeah. current technology that was being utilized. Yeah, our uh, and so these may be is... solutions solutions to world hunger problems, especially if we take these raised drain field system technologies from the Americas and then apply those to other parts of the world. You know, this is this is taking taking the innovation of the indigenous people of South America and using that to feed people in other places like yeah. Africa or, or or Southeast Asia or other places. Although they also have their agricultural systems, I don't mean to say that those systems are are in any way deficient, but just imagine taking all of the the, the areas of the world that are having food stress um, and, and presenting a variety of options, and not just one solution, but lots of lots of different possibilities that are ones that are informed by what people did in the ancient path. Returning to this issue of um, productive agricultural systems brings us to this topic of what are sometimes referred to as black earth soils mm -hmm. um, or terra preta, which is something we know from the Amazon. And two of the colleagues of mine who worked did a lot of work on this were Jim Peterson, who, who sadly died violently while he was doing research um, in Brazil. It's a horrible tragedy. Uh, and Bill Woods, who was at the University of Kansas, who did a lot of work on the soil, uh, as well as uh, Brazilian archaeologist uh, Eduardo Neves, who has also been working for decades to document these agricultural systems. But what they are finding through their excavations is the existence of these anthropogenic soils that were mm -hmm. created by burning and intentionally adding charcoal uh, to the soil, mixing it up and doing this over, in, in some case, many, many generations, hundreds of years. 
that actually made the Amazonian soils far more agriculturally productive than they ever would have been without human activity being involved. You see the excavations here. We're able to see the layers of that black earth soil uh, mm -hmm. that were created by ancient peoples of the Amazon. And Michael Heckenberger, who's been doing research here, you can see his, his book from 2005, has been documenting the existence of these black earth soils and also complex settled village sites across the Amazon basin. OK, there were hundreds of these sites, OK, most of which were, were constructed along areas of these anthropogenic black earth soils, um, but also included uh, amazing structures. And I'm going to put a plug in here for my colleague, uh, our colleague, James Q. Jacobs, mm -hmm. uh, who has been documenting thousands of these archaeological sites and making them available to the public. In fact, Jim has put his databases online for anyone to download so that you yourself can explore hundreds of these sites in the Amazon yourself using Google Earth. Do your own um, research, everybody. Do your own research. And there's a lot available out there. Now, how do we know that this is not from a lost civilization, though? Well, it, it depends on what you mean by lost, and it depends on what you mean by civilization. <laughs> and archaeologists are very <laughs> How do we know that it's words. not from the Ice Age is maybe a better question. Ah, uh, well, radiocarbon dating, archaeological excavations, all of the techniques that we use to date archaeological sites, including So associated... you're saying the carbon in the black soil has been dated? Yes. Carbon oh, in the black man. soil has been dated. Uh, charcoal <laughs> associated with pottery has been, I mean, these were pottery producing societies. So, yeah. you know, we, we don't have a lot of evidence for pottery from the Pleistocene. And, and actually, you know, certain researchers don't ever bring a single shirt from, the, from an Ice Age context. Uh, but these sites are actually associated with pottery. They're pottery making societies. So, so we, have, we, we have pottery styles. We have, we have uh, features that we can excavate and find the pottery associated with charcoal. And we can date the charcoal. And that tells us how old the pottery is. So that's how we construct these chronologies. So it's clear this is from the last few thousand years and no no earlier. Uh, well, the no earlier part, you know, things are always getting older. <laughs> um, but <laughs> it's not but, always uh, true. But there, there's a possibility that this uh, this technology actually goes back more than two thousand years. Yeah. Um, maybe to five five hundred a thousand BCE. Maybe even earlier. Who knows? But not all the way back to the Pleistocene. We're talking about a thousand years BCE or maybe three thousand years ago. We're not okay. talking eleven thousand years ago or twenty thousand years ago. Which, as I've explained, we don't have any domesticated crops from that early anyway. <laughs> no, and these were and, and these were farmers. They were growing domestic yeah. crops. In addition to the pottery, we get food remains. Yeah. We we get we get seeds, we get pollen, we get phytoliths. Unfortunately, Flint, and I feel sorry for zooarchaeologists that faunal remains are really not that abundant at these Amazonian sites because the soils are very highly acidic. There's a high yeah. amount of rainfall. It's just not great for preserving bones. So, but there are some, I mean, you always find some in some unique context, but in general, faunal remains are just not very well preserved at these sites, but we do get botanical remains and we do mm -hmm. get pottery and we do get stone tools. Um, and actually those stone tools include manos and metates from which we can recover things like starch grains and phytoliths. Uh, phytoliths are actually inorganic, so they survive very well in, yeah. in, in hot tropical climates. Um, so anyway, what Jim Jacobs has been able to document are things that people can explore. But, you know, we talked about Squire and Davis uh, mm -hmm. exploring the eastern United States. Look at what's being found in the Amazon. Um, look at what are, are being documented across the Amazon. And, and, and as I said, Jim Jacobs has documented thousands of these places. But also, look, I say, I've said the Amazon. You know, what's missing here? There's a photograph from Amazonia. Mm -hmm. Where's, the, Where's trees? the rainforest? <laughs> where where are the trees? Well, the reason why these sites are being discovered and documented is because of deforestation, because yeah. the rainforest is being converted into pasture land, uh, and because it's being developed. You can see roads in here. Look at this. This this effing road goes right across the archaeological features. Okay, <laughs> um, already these sites are being impacted by modern development, uh, and that's a problem because you know they're going to disappear, and then people will tell whatever story they want because the sites aren't there anymore. Um, yeah. But this this is a really good image because it shows that palimpsest of ancient activity, which are these ditch and embankment structures, which probably had palisades either of trees or thorny plants or cactus. Well, not probably not cactuses because it's a little too wet, but thorny trees and other types of things that, that surrounded these enclosures. 
Uh, mm -hmm. But but look at the modern impact on there. Okay, you're looking at archaeological features, and you're also looking at modern roads. And in fact, one of those modern roads parallels an ancient road. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you can tell how people were using the landscape. But you know these sites include, and again, this this could be Neolithic Europe. You know this this could be this could be Germany. This could be England. Um, but these ditch and embankment structures do not indicate that there was contact. During the Neolithic, you know, these sites don't date to 4000 BCE. They're not connected with Stonehenge, even though they might look like that. They represent parallel adaptations in similar types of farming societies that had a need for ritual, ritual enclosures, as well as for defense. You know, some of these may have been defensive structures. And I, as I said, you can plant trees or bushes or thorny plants or whatever you want around them. Uh, and that way you can better defend your community from people who want to do harm to it. Uh, but these sites are being found across the Amazon. As I said, there are thousands of them. Yeah. Uh, they have Some of them have rectangular layouts. Some of them have circular layouts. Some of them have a circular circle within a rectangle. <laughs> um, but look at this photograph again. They are being impacted by modern construction. Okay, There's a road that runs right across the archaeological feature. In a sense, um, we're seeing in real time the destruction of these kind of monuments, like what happened in North America 100 to 200 years ago, really. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, you know, here here again, and I, I don't know why this is the case, but in so many of these photographs, you see these amazing ancient features, and right on top of them is a modern road. Yeah. Okay. It, it's the deforestation and the modern construction that is revealing these places. Okay. They used to be under very dense tropical rainforest. Why were they under tropical rainforest? Because of the rich anthropogenic soils, because the black earth soils were so fertile when the people were removed as a result of disease and pandemics and colonization and, and, and genocide, the forest grew back. And the forest grew back even more lush on the anthropogenic soils than it would have grown back if they had not been anthropogenic soils. So the, yeah. one could argue that the Amazon rainforest is more dense now than it would have been because the indigenous people improved the quality of the soil itself over hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years. But when you turn it into a cattle pasture, cut off all of the trees, well, you know, the good news is you can see the archaeological sites. The bad news is you've destroyed the rainforest. Well, one of the things that really astounds me here is, yes, we have this comparison and we can see the damage done by colonialism and development and stuff like that. But at the same time, it's wrapped up in so many complex issues, you know, things like we say not to cut down these Amazon rainforests, the trees, the trees themselves are protecting these sites from development. And the trees themselves are important due to our ongoing issues of climate change. And you can see these parallels with sort of the melting of the ice in some areas, and that exposes more archeology span in a sense. So archeologists are cheering because of these developments, but we're actually not because the, these exposures, we're actually rapidly trying to raise funds to quickly document as much as we can before it's destroyed is the reality of it. We're not cheering the melting of the ice. It's an emergency for us to respond to. Um, same thing here with the, the cutting of the rainforest. Well, that's exactly right. And I will make my third plea now for more funding for archaeological research so that we can document these sites before they disappear. Yeah. Um, so that we can have a sense of what this landscape actually looked like. Um, and so that we can understand what the diversity of indigenous cultures was in the Americas, but we can also celebrate their their ingenuity, their technology. These are sites that were created by the ancestors of the living indigenous people today. Uh, something we absolutely have to talk about, Flint. That's what I was thinking we'd go to, yeah. Is, is, is community archaeology and the relationships between archaeologists and descendant communities. And I think this is important for everybody to recognize. They want us to keep politics out of archaeology, and it's just impossible. What's happening politically around us, whether it's socioeconomics, cutting down of rainforests to turn it into ranches, or whether it's how we uh, cooperate and collaborate with the local stakeholders of these regions and of these sites, all of this is wrapped up in what we do. And we, we have to be aware of all these issues when we, when we do our archaeological research, because it's part and parcel of it. But I think what's a very important to, uh, to emphasize here, Flint, is that archaeologists today are working together with the descendant communities. Um, this is something that, that Jenny Raff emphasized in, in, in her interview, and I'm going to emphasize it also, is that archaeologists 
are working to tell the story of the indigenous peoples of the Americas in a way that will benefit them uh, so that they can make very valid evidence-based claims to territory, so they can make very valid evidence-based claims to their heritage and their sacred sites, uh, and also so that they can define what it is that the questions are that we're going to look at. And here's where I'm going to get a little bit political. The integration of indigenous voices includes recognition of the reality that a large percentage of the people at the southern border in the United States are indigenous people. Okay, they yeah, didn't grow up speaking sure. Spanish. They grew up speaking their indigenous languages. And it's because of the things that the, our country has been doing that has made their countries dangerous. The, the drug cartels, the narcos, the violence, and other types of things that are a result of American consumption and American addiction to all of these drugs yeah. uh, is, is creating more violence in, in Latin America. So people who are seeking to protect their children, seeking to, to have better lives, are coming to the United States as a result of the things that we are doing in Latin America. And a very important story is that it's these people in cages at the southern border who are the descendants of the people who built pyramids, who had amazing sites, who created the anthropogenic soils of the Amazon, and all of the things that we're looking at in the legacy of ancient Latin America. Those are their ancestors. That's yeah. their story. And that includes, unfortunately, children who have who have died uh, as a result of violence. Um, the cultures of the Americas never disappeared. They are still there. There mm -hmm. are millions of indigenous people who cherish their culture uh, and who are living it every single day. Among the things that they are doing, and archaeologists have helped with this, is they're learning Maya hieroglyphs again. They're learning their own story. They're learning their own history. And these, Nelida and Merlin, are the faces of the next archaeologists. They are the ones who are going to become archaeologists studying their own culture and their own history. Uh, and there's a huge amount of promise in helping educate the descendant communities uh, to do research on what they want to know about their heritage and their ancestry. Um, and this includes, you know, modern dancers, people who are reviving their culture. Uh, these are some Aztec dancers that I uh, encountered at uh, December 21st, 2012 ceremonies at Chichen Itza. Okay. Uh, there, there are people who are very proud of their ancestry and are living it every day. Uh, there are also the indigenous people themselves, including Guna women of Panama and Koki Mamas of Northern Colombia, who are the wisdom keepers. They're the ones who know the stories. They're the ones who are still living today in patterns that go all the way back before the arrival of the Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, and it's cultural heritage sites like Tyrona National Park in, in, in Colombia that help people to imagine what these look like because they actually put the roofs back on, the, on these ancient structures and help people to understand what's there. So anyway, I wanted to get that little part in. Of course. Um, I don't know whether there's time for me to do plugs on my stuff. We yeah, let's end with some of, of your that. research. I think let's end with some lost cities of Costa Rica. Okay. My own research has focused on what's called the Isthmo Colombian area, um, which is um, the area of eastern Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, and northern Colombia. Um, I don't look for lost cities. Okay. A lot of my research has focused on things like museum collections. Uh, the legacies of things that that were obtained from these cultures. Uh, one of the reasons why these cultures were so devastated by the contact with the Spanish is that they had gold, they had mm -hmm. bling, they had precious objects that they were making and exchanging using very uh, sophisticated techniques of metallurgy. They were reproducing in gold, sometimes in traditions that lasted a thousand years, um, their shamans, their dancers, their belief systems, um, and their technology was amazing for doing this. This is this is something that was produced by a technique called lost wax casting. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. it, it comes from the Cauca Valley in Colombia. Um, and uh, these are representations of kind of seated shamans in the process of meditating. Uh, Which, actually... by the way, lost wax casting is used in the Mediterranean, ancient Mediterranean as well. So it shows how independently different groups of people come up with similar techniques to solve similar problems. Yeah, absolutely. They didn't learn how to do this from the Mediterranean. Uh, they 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 invented it themselves and 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 perfected it, and were making amazing things. Uh, but one of the models that I use for talking about the Americas uh, is actually, and I focus on what I like to refer to as the center of the Americas, 
Uh, but one of the models that I've been using, Flint, is the concept of the American Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. uh, the Caribbean and the Mediterranean are about the same size. Huh. Uh, they actually both cover almost a, a similar area uh, in, ter in terms of square kilometers. These are, images are both at the same scale. Okay, mm -hmm. And it's impossible to imagine the ancient world of Europe and North Africa and the Levant and Turkey without realizing the Mediterranean uh, was, was an area of communication. People were traveling across it all the time. People were traveling in boats, communicating with each other, carrying things all around. Well, the same thing was happening in the Americas. Mm -hmm. It was just happening in the Gulf of Mexico and in the Caribbean. Uh, and people have simply not paid as much attention to it as they should. This is one of my shticks: is that we need to look more at the interaction that was taking place among peoples of the Antilles, people of Mesoamerica, people of the Isthmus Colombian area, people of the Northern Andes and the Amazon. And if we could just think about the Caribbean as sort of the American Mediterranean, just imagine all of these other ancient, you know, worlds of of, of communication among lots of different kinds of people that were taking place. Um, and we see patterns across Costa Rica, northern Colombia, of very similar types of settlements, some of with roads, ditch and embankment structures, and other mm -hmm. types of things. Sites like uh, like Ciudad Perdida in Colombia. Uh, here's here's a, a map that shows all of the structures that were located there. It's a, a site that's literally called Lost City, um, but it's no located in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta of northern, northern Colombia. Um, but they were building structures... Uh, of perishable material. Now, mm -hmm. people say, you know, well, they were they advanced, were they civilized? Well, apparently, if you weren't building out of stone, then you weren't civilized. But if you were building out of sustainable, perishable materials, then you're somewhat, you know, less developed, less advanced. Well, that's bullshit. Yeah. Building out of perishable materials is sustainable. <laughs> and we had very big structures that were that were built out of perishable materials. They don't survive as well as pyramids, they don't survive as well as palaces. But this just gives you a glimpse of what, what was there in the past. Uh, and in Costa Rica, my colleagues have been mapping and documenting archaeological sites for 100 years. Okay, This this is research at, at, at an archaeological site that was first being explored by looters uh, in the late 19th century. And today, archaeologists from the National Museum of Costa Rica are returning and are finding uh, and documenting the context of some of the ancient sculptures that were removed from these sites 100 years ago. Huh. Um, these are not very well known. You know, people know the Mayas and the Incas and the Aztecs, but I focus on the cultures that were a little bit farther to the south uh, that were producing these these amazing sculptures. Oh, very um, nice. Kind of Chakmul type uh, figures. That's what they're referred to. I don't think that they're Chakmuls, but these are these are uh, ritual basins made, made of, uh, of, of ground uh, basalt and andesite. Uh, and they were not constructing out of blocks. Here, here's an amazing thing. They were constructing out of river, rounded river cobbles. Mm -hmm, <laughs> this is what mm -hmm. they used to make their walls. Just imagine how difficult it is to build something out of slippery round rocks. But they were doing it. And they were building house foundations. They were building roads. Uh, they were constructing large houses uh, and large complexes, uh, such as Guayaba de Turialba, which is found in central Costa Rica. They were making beautifully carved stone slabs with very uh, detailed ornamentation. And this is what those structures look like, built out of those slippery rounded river cobbles, which mm -hmm. included in them occasionally some tombs and, and burials. But this is the remains. This is what the archaeological signature is of something that originally looked like this. Okay, uh, And these circular structures were part of concentrations of the circular structures. Now, what I want to show you here, and maybe we can finish with this or I can continue, is a, a, a combination of these round circular house foundations, roads that are coming in from at least four different directions, mm -hmm. ditch and embankment structures that created a defensive fortifications around the center. And what you're looking at on the left is what archaeologists have documented using plane tables and alidades and brunt and compasses and, and, and kind of old techniques of mapping. What you uh -huh. see on the right is a satellite image in which virtually all of those features have disappeared. Yeah, exactly. Uh, through, through the modern road construction that runs right across it. Through uh, Those are actually, the dark part is pineapple plantations. Huh. Uh, but you can see how that archaeological infrastructure has almost completely disappeared uh, yeah. as a result of modern development, which is, which is one of the reasons why we have to kind of dig deep and find these. And the project that, one of the projects that I've worked on is at a site called Nuevo Corinto, where um, you can actually see our project in the Google Earth imagery, but we were creating detailed topographic maps uh, that showed the locations of these circular structures and the roads that led into them. We were undertaking excavations 
uh, to reveal this architecture that was built out of river cobbles, which included large uh, platforms, uh, some of them surrounded by walls, uh, plazas, roads, uh, all of these things that at one time were covered by dense tropical rainforest, uh, but are actually places where people were making sculpture, making gold work, uh, making pottery, and a whole host of other things. And then maybe maybe to finish up, Flint, I'll talk about this uh, this this interesting phenomenon that I have also been engaged with uh, researching in southern Costa Rica, along with my colleagues Ifigenia Quintanilla and Francisco Corrales. Um, mm -hmm. Among the things that we've uh -huh. been doing research on are the big stone balls. Some of big which stone are... balls. That's what Professor Hoops is famous for. He's got <laughs> big, big stone balls. Yeah, I've got <laughs> I've got big balls. Uh, you know, these are really unique and unusual artifacts or monuments. Uh, they vary in size from a few centimeters in diameter to all the way up to 1.8 meters in diameter. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're big, great, great big things. They're mysterious objects. Why did people make them? Where did they come from? Well, archeological excavations have revealed them in context. Uh, the, mm. the term that archeologists refer to is in situ. We have found uh, or my colleague Francisco Corrales has, has, has been able to excavate stone spheres in situ. And where are they found? They're found at the corners of entrance ramps to these big oh. circular houses. Okay, they were basically used to adorn these big structures, which, again, were built out of slippery rounded river cobbles. How do you get a structure like that to even stand up? Well, they were able to. And these uh, stone spheres have been found in association with mortuary features that include pottery, they include stone tools, uh, here you can see a small stone sphere in association with that. Um, and so the archaeology, the careful archaeology uh, under the rainforest has been able to document these stone spheres in situ together with the remains of the structures that were associated with them and the pottery and the stone tools and the radiocarbon dates that help us to establish a very clear context for these objects, which, yeah, they're weird objects. They're, they're, they're enigmatic objects, but they are not mysteries. They are known to archeologists who not only have done the excavations and documented them in situ and seen what all of their associations are and dated them, but they've used all of this information to be able to designate sites with stone spheres uh, as, as UNESCO World Heritage. Uh, and mm -hmm. this is a project that uh, Francisco Corrales and Ifigenia Quintanilla and uh, a number of archaeologists were involved with. Uh, anybody who knows anything about World Heritage designations by UNESCO know that this is a multi-year process. It takes an enormous amount of documentation uh, to be able to reach that status. Um, and the sites with stone spheres were inscribed 10 years ago. We're now mm -hmm. celebrating the 10th anniversary of their inscription in the UNESCO World Heritage List. But this is the culmination of what archaeologists do. Okay, These stone spheres are not a mystery. Ancient aliens will tell you, oh, they're a mystery. We don't know anything about them. And other people will tell you that too. That's bullshit. We know a lot about them, about their context. And not only do we know a lot about their context, we know so much that we've been able to have them declared as UNESCO World Heritage, which takes a lot of knowledge and documentation. It doesn't It doesn't come out of nowhere. Yeah, no, I agree. Let's end with a, just a quick few minutes of chit chat. Um, so yeah, I think that was really good. I think in many ways that was a very solid pre-bunk of what will probably, some of it will show up in season two of Ancient Apocalypse. And I mean, I think the key thing here is to provide the larger context of these cultures, the archeological evidence, how archaeologists have approached it in the past and how they're approaching it today. And that's what I think should inform everybody who's still watching. Hopefully somebody's still watching. Are you there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been going on for a, a bit, but that's great. But I could talk about this all day, Flint. Um, and one of the things that we chuckle about all the time is people say, well, you know, archaeologists don't want to tell you this. Well, that's not true. We would talk your ears off telling you about this. <laughs> you know, just, just start a conversation with an archaeologist and you can't get them to stop. Uh, I know. And I mean, I've learned this. so much. I've had Indonesian archaeologists on. I've had Americanist archaeologists on. I have people that work with Stone Age all the way down to more recent stuff. And it's like, you know, it's, it's actually amazing for me. I'm an archaeologist. I've been doing archaeology from by far most of my life. And in fact, really my entire life because my dad was an archaeologist. And it's just there's so much to learn. It's such a rich, deep field, if you see what I mean, that, that nobody can understand it all. It's not. Yeah, possible. well, I've been doing it. I got interested in archaeology um, in high school when I wrote that paper on Atlantis. That's what started me on my journey. And I've been doing it for 50 years. And 
You know, how many people do something for 50 years and don't get bored with it? I've never gotten bored with archaeology, never once. Uh, and yeah, they're boring things that we do in archaeology, but but I have found it to be a rich and rewarding career. And I would encourage as many people out there who are as interested in this stuff as we are to go do it. You know, you don't have to be an archaeologist to learn this stuff. Um, and also, and here's my fourth plug, get people to spend more money to fund archaeological research and, and, yeah, to real get, research and to help us to do research on these things. If you find it interesting, if you find it worthwhile, then seek for federal funding of more archaeology. Seek yeah. for international funding of more archaeology. Seek private foundations to fund archaeology, but but fund more archaeology. And I think it's key, is in particular, I, we've highlighted in several places where archaeology is under threat. It is it, all over the world. It's not just in the Amazon that archaeology is under threat. All over the world, due to human development, due to climate change, due to changes in the landscape, archaeology is disappearing around us. And so there's a real pressing need to do this kind of research and documentation before it's gone for our descendants, right? The, the future people of this planet will not have access to this finite resource because we are using it up in a sense. Areas where we've declared it protected with UNESCO World Heritage Sites like Gobekli Tepe, some of these stone spheres, some of that stuff will still be around and we'll be able to excavate it and study it in different ways in the future with new technology, but it's the areas that are really under threat that are, there's a pressing need for quickly uh, doing this kind of investigation and research. Well, that's exactly right. And people should not misinterpret, you know, when it's reported that there are 60,000 structures found under the rainforest in Guatemala, that doesn't mean, oh, there's plenty there. Every one of those 60,000 structures is threatened. Every one of those 60,000 structures is endangered by, by looting, by construction, uh, by tourism even. Uh, there are all kinds of processes that are threatening every single one of those uh, uh, archaeological sites. If those are wiped out, if they disappear, then people can make up whatever story they want about the ancient past. Archaeology is about using evidence to be able to make a persuasive argument for what actually really did happen in the past. Uh, and and it's, really, it's really detailed, it's really sophisticated, it's really interesting and appealing. But erasing the past allows you to invent uh, whatever story you want. Uh, if you don't have evidence, you can tell whatever the hell story you want. Um, and, and that's dangerous uh, because all kinds of ideologies have been created uh, with the absence of evidence or the misuse of evidence or the misrepresentation of evidence. Uh, and those of us who are pro-science and pro-history and in favor of higher education, imagine that. Uh, are the ones who know how important these stories really are. Yeah, great. I think those are great last words. Thank you very much, uh, Professor John Hoops. Um, it was great to talk with you. And uh, I firmly believe we should be taking advantage of archaeology and the media in any way possible to share what we actually do. And I think we've done that. So good job. Thank you. Thank you.